Take time to be holy, let him be thy guide. Lord Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity. <coughs> thank you for every person, every child, every adult brother and sister, every elderly being here. Lord, we submit ourselves into you. We ask for your Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us through your word today as we seek to comprehend deeper your love for us, your matchless charms. Be with me, give utterance to my lips, I pray, and give power to your word that you've prepared for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Still doing that. What's a sacrifice? Anybody? Giving up something of real value for something else, for someone, is it? <coughs> for someone? Anybody else? When you put someone else instead of yourself. Or yourself instead of someone else. Yeah, yeah. We keep this in mind as we go through this sermon, okay? Um, year 1992. Does anybody remember themselves in 1992? What happened in 1992? I was 11 years old. The Soviet Union has just crumbled. My granddad passed away. Jehovah's Witnesses knocked at our door and offered Bible studies. And my parents agreed. They were raised in an atheistic Soviet society. And they just wanted to know, what does the Bible say about people who pass away? What happens when they die? And I'm grateful for this opportunity. Because as we know, Jehovah's Witnesses believe the same thing as we believe about the state of the dead. And that started us on the path where we came, my family came to, um, to the Advent message, to the Advent truth, the three angels message. As the Soviet Union crumbled, on the other side of the Soviet Union, there was another girl, a 16-year-old girl, Almira, who was offered to take classes on supernatural extrasensorics in her school, or shall we say spiritualism. The story of Almira is written in our quarterly book. You can read it. Um, you can find it in the previous quarter, it's in the same book that we have today. Omira took the classes as, you know, all these um, churches and beliefs and denominations and as, as well as spiritualism was starting to emerge after the fall of, this, of the communism. She eventually found herself haunted by the dark forces. And in one of her struggles with a demon who attempted to kill her, he finally called upon the name of Jesus. She was delivered. The demon fled. Subsequently, if you read the story, she came to know some Adventists and she started to attend an Adventist church. Almira prayed and read the Bible every night to keep the evil spirit at bay. She attended the church every Sabbath, enduring painful criticisms from her parents, relatives, and neighbors. Do you see the old communism mindset was still in the people? Um, she went through a bit of a persecution. But the rest of her life remained unchanged. She went to school during the week and at the weekends after her church, she partied with her friends at nightclubs. At 18 years old, Almira reached a crossroads in her Christian faith. She came across a question she could not answer. She could not understand why the Bible called Jesus' death a sacrifice. To her, Jesus' death didn't seem like a sacrifice. Yes, he was cruelly persecuted and cruelly treated and finally crucified, but surely he was God and he knew that this was going to happen. So how was his death a sacrifice? In contrast, Almira herself faced persecution every Sabbath. She felt like she sacrificed her relationships with her parents, relatives, and friends for Jesus. She had no idea how her story would end, and she seemed to have made a greater sacrifice. Do we sometimes feel that way? 
Yeah? Even after her powerful delivery by Christ from the dark forces of Satan and coming into the truth message, the SDA church, she loved the world and the worldliness. Can you relate to that? I certainly can. I was first baptized when I was 19. I say first because I was rebaptized later on here. That night, after my baptism, I remember myself clearly lying on my bed, just going to bed, and God spoke to me, are you ready to give up everything to me? Are you ready to surrender fully to me? And I remember as a young person of 19 years old, just, just after school, the life felt so exciting. And I said, really, do I have to give up this and that to you? Yeah, surely I want to be saved. I want to be in church. But can I just, can I just try out these things a little bit more? I'm so excited about, you know, being out with my boyfriends and going out and trying things out, you know. And so I did not make a surrender at that time. I was like Almira, feeling that it's too much to sacrifice. We are all physically or emotionally attached to something. Attached to things, people, concepts, pride, bad habits, whatever it is. Surrender is another word for sacrifice. So whose sacrifice is greater? To understand something about the magnitude of what cost God to save us, we will look at some Bible characters. So what was the greatest sacrifice story in the Old Testament? It was in our memory verse. <laughs> the story of Abraham. Our memory verse says, By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he had received the promises offered up. He that received the promises offered up his only begotten son. The full story is written in Genesis 22. You can open Genesis 22 if you want. But our memory verse continues from Hebrews 11, verse 18, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Genesis 22, verses 9 to 10. And they came to the place which God had told him. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Just picture this. How does Abraham feel? What was he thinking? What was going through his mind? This is his son, his only son. This is a miracle child, a son of promise whom God has given him. It is bad enough, but what makes it even worse is that Isaac is the seed bearer. In Isaac it says, shall thy seed be called. So who is the seed? Galatians 3.16 says, and to thy seed which is Christ. Speaking of Abraham, it says, his seed was Christ. Abraham received God's promises that through his loins will come into the world the seed or the savior of the world. Will he be Abraham's savior too? Yes. The whole Bible is actually about the seed. Do you remember that very first time of the gospel mentioned in Genesis 3.15? Yeah? The seed of the woman against the seed of the serpent. Now, you see, the serpent is after that seed. He will do everything to destroy the seed. And God will do everything to preserve the seed. No seed, no salvation. Did Abraham know about Christ? Yes, because we read in John 8:56, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, Jesus said. And he saw it and was glad. It was called faith. He was looking forward to the Savior. So picture this scene again. A Abraham is offering Isaac. 
he's stretching forth his hand with the knife to slay the seed. What is going to happen to the world savior who is in loins of Isaac? Not only he is asked to part with his beloved son with one slit of the knife, not only he is cutting his beloved son's throat, he is cutting the only hope, the only rope of salvation for the humankind and for himself. Does this make sense? This is why the Bible says regarding Abraham in Romans 4.18, who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations. You see, he believed God's word against God's word. Was that unreasonable? Is God unreasonable? Does God contradict himself? No. But it was a test. It was a showcase of God's true character, laying open of God the Father's heart. In this story, we can focus on the faith of Abraham. Or we can study Abraham as a figure to focus on the heart of God the Father and the risk for the entire universe. You see, the truth about God's character is at stake in this great controversy. God's character has been misrepresented, mis misshapen, and dragged through the mud. My heart is drawn after indicating of God's character. We may not realize its full magnitude, but there's people out there who believe in Jesus, yet it's a different Jesus. There's people out there who say Lucifer is a friend. What would you say to that? And surely understanding of God is love is not what we believe that God is love. In the story of Abraham, we know that in the book of Romans, Paul gives us the insight in Romans 4.17, for example, that Abraham believed that God, who quickens the dead and calleth those things which are not as though they are. Abraham went into this test with the perfect faith. It says in, in Hebrews 11 that we read 17, by faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, In Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead. Has there been a resurrection prior to that time in the history? There hasn't been a resurrection, yet Abraham knew that God was able to raise Isaac. He went to trust God's word against God's word, knowing that God is able. He was powerful enough. That's the faith of Jesus. Abraham is displaying the faith of Jesus. And he's calling things that are not as, this, as if they are. But let us, let us focus now. Let us focus now differently. Let us focus on the heart of God the Father. We know how the story ended with a happy end. Abraham was tested. He endured the test. His hand was stopped by the angel of the Lord. Who is the angel of the Lord? Jesus. That's Jesus before coming into this earth. Michael Fay, who is the angel of the Lord? We studied it this morning <laughs> in our devotional. Jesus, Michael. In Old Testament, the reference to the angel of the Lord, when he meets Joshua, when he meets Moses at the burning bush, when he leads the Israelites through the desert, it's Jesus. It even becomes even more mind-boggling. But we move on now. Now, the angel of the Lord stopped his hand. Isaac was spared. A ram was found for burnt offering. It was provided. Now, if Abraham is a type of God the Father, and Isaac is a type of God the Son, Jesus, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world, then by giving up his son for us, what degree of risk is heaven undertaking? Remember, Abraham was about to cut the only rope of his own salvation, or shall I say, his own existence. Everything was put on the line. Thinking about God the Father, 
God pledged himself. He has loved us more than his own existence. One of our pioneers, E.J. Wagner, puts it this way. God pledged his own existence and with it the entire universe for our salvation. So the story continues. After Isaac was spared, after the ram was found for the burnt offering, the angel of the Lord calls out to Abraham second time in verse 16. The angel of the Lord said, uh, and the angel of the Lord called into Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, by myself have I sworn, says the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son. And he's repeating the promises, that promises that had been given to Abraham before, but now he seals it with an oath. He pledges his own existence to that promise. God adds to the promise his oath. And in Hebrews 6.13 we read, for, for when God made promises to Abraham, because he could not swear by greater, he swore by himself. Hebrews 6.13. If you remember the story in Genesis 15 about the flaming torch passing between the cuts, cut pieces of sacrifice, God is saying, let it be done to me as it is done to these animals if I do not keep to my promise. God is putting himself on the line and with him, the whole universe. It's mind boggling. It's mind blowing. Along with Abraham, who is ready to give up his eternal salvation, other Bible characters are ready to give up or risk their eternal salvation too. Can you think of any? Moses? Moses said, when people have sinned and built a golden calf, Moses said, yet now if thou forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of the book which thou hast written. Exodus 32, 32. Abraham is prepared to lay his life, eternal <coughs> life, for others. David, in 2 Samuel 18, verse 33, when he, he learns about the death of his son Absalom, the son who rebelled against him. The king was much moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went, as he said, Oh, my son, Absalom, my son, my son, would God I had died for thee. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Remember, the death of Absalom was a type of the second death. Cursed is the one that hangeth on the tree. Absalom was caught to hang on the tree, and that's how he died. Here David projects himself into that second death instead of his son. I would rather die instead of you. Queen Esther was prepared to lay down her life, her eternal life, for the salvation of her people. In Esther 4.16 she says, And so I will go into the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. The same word perish is used in the famous verse of John 3.16, only in a good sense. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That denotes or implies second death. What have all these characters seen in the person of God and his character that they have understood something that Almira and many, many of us still failing to see and understand today. You see, it's not about my salvation. It's about loving God so much that it sets us free from our petty egoism. We love him because he first loved us. Can we, st can we start comprehending something of God and what he put at stake for us? Let's talk about the Godhead, the triune God. It's like a family. Me as a, being here as a family, represent, family ministry representative, we often talk about Godhead as a family, right? With the three persons. God has to be more than one in order for him to be love, to give that love, to put others first. This is true love. Talk about that loving family relationship that Godhead had enjoyed in eternity. 
The triune Godhead tears apart. God the Father gives away his son for the human race, which is equivalent of Abraham putting his only begotten son to death. In early writings, we, we read this, it was a struggle for the father to give up his only son. Said the angel, think ye that the father yielded up his dearly beloved son without a struggle? No, no, it was even a struggle for the God of heaven, whether to let guilty men perish or to give his darling son to die for them. Do you think father loves his son? How much more does he love us? if he chooses to give up his son for us. How much more he loves you. He's a personal God. He loves you and he gave himself up for you. Jesus is taking upon himself the human nature to forever retain it. We know that he used to be the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament times. Or he was also known as Michael in the heavenly courts. The one like God, God the Son, yet he's going to become Jesus, that helpless baby. He's going to assume different nature and he's going to retain it. He'll no longer be back to what he used to be. Would you send your child to war knowing that this war is gonna change him or her? If not physically, it definitely takes toll on a person's personality and mind. Most of the time people also suffer physically. And he'll never be the same again. God gave his only begotten son. Now mind you, he gave, not lend. He did not lend him. He gave him up to become one of the human family, forever to retain his human nature. This is the pledge that God will fulfill his word. God has adopted human nature in the person of his son. It's from Desire of Ages. In taking our nature, the Savior has bound himself to humanity by a tie that is never to be broken. Through the eternal ages, he is linked with us. Now, imagine an eternity past, this angel of the Lord, this, this Michael adored of all the angels. Time comes, the clock is ticking away, and it's time for him to go. He vanishes, he's gone just to be born here as a helpless baby. What risk? How vulnerable is a little baby? How vulnerable is a baby? You know that. What risk to heaven? Christ, human nature, a little baby. And yet, too, he had to grow just as any other baby. He emptied himself of all divine prerogatives to rely fully on the Father by faith. Christ took humanity with all its liabilities. He took the nature of man with the possibility of yielding to temptation, and he relied upon divine power to keep him. Jesus accepted humanity, with the humanity when the race had been weakened by 4,000 years of sin. Like every child of Adam, he accepted the results of the working of the great law of heredity. What these results were is shown in the history of his earthly ancestors. He came with such a heredity to share our sorrows and our temptations and to give us the example of a sinless life. This is from Desire of Ages 48. Abraham sacrificing Isaac, like cutting his own throat, destroying all the prospects of salvation of oneself and the entire human race. Abraham is a type of God the Father. What a tremendous insight into God the Father's heart, the magnitude of the risk. The greater the love, the greater the risk. Abraham offered Isaac at Mount Moriah is a shadow which reaches its full apex and beams in its full daylight at Calvary where Jesus is dying, the equivalent of our second death. Almira's story continues. Even after her powerful delivery by Christ from the forces of Satan and coming to an SDA church, she still loved the world and the worldliness. Finally, Almira discovers the cost of heaven, that the heaven paid to save her, and the magnitude of God's sacrifice. 
one day in answer to her prayer, she stumbles across a quote in Desire of Ages. The quote says, Satan, with his fierce temptations, wrung the heart of Jesus. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave of conqueror or tell him of the Father's acceptance of his sacrifice. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was to be eternal. Jesus, a sinless one, a sinless Lamb of God, now is weighed down with sin of humanity, of my and your sin. He feels like he cannot be accepted. He feels like he's a goner. He's going for it for you and me. Jesus was so afraid that he would die forever, but he had been ready to take the risk for her. It struck her that he had not known the end, but he had risked his eternal life to save her. At Calvary, Christ could not see through the portals of the tomb. This is the equivalent of the second death experience. Finally, Omer discover, discovers something that moves and pierces her heart with such conviction to a point of breaking it. Her motivation changes, her mind is being transformed. She is realizing something of the magnitude of the risk and she's falling in love with Jesus. And surrender of everything to God becomes strangely easy and pleasant. With tears in her eyes, she pours out her soul and heart to God in this prayer. Jesus, if no one else will follow you, follow you in this whole world, I will follow you. She gave her life to Jesus in baptism, and today her husband and she had served as missionaries in North Caucasus region in Russia, and she is presently serving as a as a teacher in Zaukski Adventist University in Russia. Mm -hmm. Her husband is a pastor and the vice president for student affairs at the university. Excuse me, please. Have you discovered the cost of Christ's sacrifice? Study Calvary. Study Christ's human nature. Study the most precious message, the 1888 message, Righteousness by Faith. One of the messengers, the late messengers of the most precious message, Robert Wieland, gives this definition of faith. Faith is a heartfelt appreciation of what caused, caused God to save us. Faith is the heartfelt appreciation of what it caused God to save us. Discover it. Appreciate. Believe. So let me ask you today, what sacrifice? are you willing to make? If this message has touched your heart today, if you are like Almira, discovering something beautiful of the magnitude of the risk that heaven, that heaven is going through for us, and if you're falling in love with God even more, you're being drawn after Him, and you would like to rededicate your life to Him in absolute surrender, I would invite you to stand with me for a prayer. For whosoever shall save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Let's pray. Dear Father, what was said today, what has touched my heart, I pray for my brothers and sisters here, touch their hearts too. Lord, Forgive us where we have faltered, where we have not seen, we have not, we've failed to comprehend. We, we're so <coughs> finite beings, Lord. But if you're touching our hearts now, Lord, help us just to go with it and pledge ourselves to you. Help us to pledge ourselves to you every night and every morning in our silent prayer, just like our mirror. If no one else will follow you, I will follow you, Lord. Everything else that has been keeping us away from you is nothing compared to what you have done for us, compared to the cost that you have paid, compared to the risk that you have run. Bless us now, Lord, that we serve you out of pure motivation of love. Bless each one of us as we go our separate ways to draw nearer 
and to leave anything that's holding us back to leave it behind. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Take time to be holy. Let him be thy God.